Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. Why do people take birth control even though they're not sexually active? How can I better support my partner in contraception choices? How do I even start talking to my teen about contraception? And do I need to if I just teach them about abstinence? Hey everybody, today on Birds and Bees Podcast, we are talking about these questions and more. It's all about contraception today, how to implement it, understanding it, and teaching it to our teens. Rebecca Simmons joins me on the show today, and she is a research assistant professor at the University of Utah in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Simmons directs the evaluation for statewide contraceptive initiative. Dr. Simmons essentially works and researches fertility awareness-based methods, comprehensive contraceptive access, health technology, and implementation of contraception. So she knows what she's talking about when it comes to implementation, contraception, and education. I'm so excited to bring her on the show today. This episode is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit. The 2019 Rocky Mountain Sex Summit will be doing a deep dive into reproductive sexual health through understanding our reproductive journey, what the impact of contraceptive choices are in our sex life, and many more. Rebecca Simmons is actually one of the presenters at the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit this year, and they're presenting on November 16th. The topic, you guessed it, contraception, and how it affects our choices in sexual practices. Today's episode is meant to give us a general understanding about contraception with men, how to talk to teens about contraception, and the laws that affect contraception. If you find this episode supportive, I encourage you to share this with someone that you know, because they need to know this information. We need to keep the buzz alive, and the only way we do that is by sharing and talking about it. If we don't talk about it, so people never know what contraception is or what options that there are. By you sharing this, it helps the podcast grow. It helps all of us be able to grow together and to keep these conversations started and going. So I appreciate those of you who have shared this information with your friends who left reviews. It helps so much, and I I really appreciate you doing that. If you have any questions or you'd like to hear something on the podcast, please feel free to give me a call and leave me a voicemail at 385-449-1818, or you can email me at birdsandbeastpodcast at gmail.com. On the personal note, I am going to go on the Late Late Show with James Corden to Chug Mustard on November 18th, 2019. That is going to be all for helping support parents to mustard up the courage to talk to their kids about sexual health. That's the whole reason I drink yellow mustard, and I'm excited to share that with you too. I'll I'll be sharing that on on the Facebook page as well as the Instagram page when it comes out. But if you want to watch it uh, live, you can watch it November 18th. Anyways, let's get on with the show. Let's start talking about contraception because this is an important part of our sex life. So thank you for being on Birds and Bees podcast and tuning in. I appreciate every one of you. Let's get on to the show. Hey everybody, this is Braxton Dutson with Birds and Bees podcast. I am so excited to have you here today because I have Rebecca Simmons today talking to us about contraception. So excited to have you here on the show, Rebecca. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself when it comes to how you got into contraception work and and research, right? You you research up at the University of Utah? I do, yeah. So um, I'm from Utah, so my background is in Utah, born and bred and lived here for most of my life with some exceptions. I did all of my schooling up at the University of Utah, except for the first part where I was at BYU Hawaii. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then when I was finished, well, before I finished school, um, I moved to DC and I was doing some work in international reproductive health. So a lot of my work is in global health and women's reproductive health across the world. Oh, wow. Um, and so I've done, you know, contraceptive research and work like that in different countries. And I had the opportunity to come back here and work with in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the U and do contraceptive research 
for Utahns. Um, oh, wow. And so that's that's kind of what brought me here. Nice. So you're doing contraceptive research currently? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. That's wonderful. Yeah. And when we're talking contraceptive research, what, what does that involve? I, I think, I know that when I hear contraception, I think female-bodied individuals. Sure. Is that what you're focusing on? Well, you know, it's complicated. I imagine. (laughs) (laughs) The idea with contraception is, you know, avoiding pregnancy. Um, People use hormonal contraceptive methods for other things. Um, There are medical uses for hormonal contraception. But when I'm thinking and talking about contraception, I'm thinking about um, the activities that people engage in to prevent pregnancy. And that could be somebody who has a female body. That could be somebody who has a male body. Because in reality, we all do things to prevent or avoid pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, we've done research on male bodied people as well as female bodied people and and also people who are kind of navigating that space. Oh, nice. So all sorts of research from all All sorts of research (laughs) and all over people. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. So as you're here, you're going to be a part of the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit come uh, November 16th. That's right. And as you're presenting there, can you give us a little bit of a... um, I guess a little bit of a teaser of what what you might be talking about there. Yeah. So one of the things that I have been doing research on most recently is this idea of how we navigate contraception throughout our lives. Um, typically, the way that the medical establishment has tended to look at contraception is it's kind of like a one and done, right? There's this idea that you get on something and poof, you're done. Yep. Um, but that's not the reality of most people's lives. And uh, so my, my thought and my presentation is really kind of helping us think through how we navigate contraceptive use, how we decide what types of methods we're going to use, what, how, what we should talk to with our providers, what we should talk to with our kids, with our friends, with our family, um, to support people on this kind of journey that they're on. Um, because the reality is that, um, you know, you spend... 30 plus years of your life trying to avoid a pregnancy (laughs) and three or so years trying to achieve pregnancy. The the average person spends 30 plus years of their lives trying to avoid getting pregnant. And that means that we're all on this journey for the most part, male and female bodied people. Yeah, definitely. I'd never put it to a place of... (laughs) <laughs> how many years am I trying not to get pregnant? How many years am I trying to get pregnant? There tends to be that focus on just the years that you would like to yeah. have a child. Yeah, I think contraception is really interesting because I think pregnancy is actually really interesting because it's really the only area in our lives where we want to avoid it, avoid, 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 and then suddenly flip a switch and say, oh my gosh, now I want to get pregnant right now. <laughs> and then turn that thing off. I don't want to get pregnant after this baby. You know, so Stop it's it. very, it's very <laughs> different than any other health area in our lives. Um, and I think that some of the approaches that we've taken up to this point don't really account for that uniqueness. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you're going to be covering that at the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit. Yes. The different ways, different things that we're thinking of it, how it impacts our, if I understand correct, also how it impacts our sexual selves. Yeah. How, yeah. It, how it affects intimacy and sexuality and things like that. Right. And, you know, fundamentally at its heart, you know, my colleague, Dr. Jessica Sanders will always say, um, People use contraception to have sex. They don't have sex to use contraception. It's, you know, this is really coming back to this idea that contraceptive use gets down to this idea that we want to have sex and people have sex for lots of reasons. Um, And this is one of those things that we all kind of deal with um, because we want to have these relationships and we want to have, yes. we want to do these activities. So. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that comes to one of the questions I'm going to get to today where we have parents listening to the the show and they're like, yeah, cool. Like, let's talk about contraception for me. And then we're going to start talking about contraception <laughs> for teenagers, right. which can make some parents skin crawl a little bit. Right. So right. as we as we're talking about, I wanted to give that teaser as well as just we'd love to have anybody that uh, is listening to this that that wants to know more about contraception to be able to go to RockyMountainSexSummit.com and buy their ticket, 
You don't need to get the ones with continuing education units. If you are a parent, if you're someone that just wants to know more about your body or about your partner's body, it, it's open to everybody. As we're talking about today, though, because um, we're not going to give away everything that you're saying, <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, we, I want to know a little bit more about the how men can can be involved in this contraception and how they can play more of a role because as i started out the show the first thing i think of whenever i think contraception is oh, the pill or sure condoms and who carries those is all up for like the debate of who should right yeah um and i i would love to see more of the when we say contraception I'm like oh there's so much that's going on so c- tell me a little bit more about what how how can a man or male bodied individuals enter this uh, this realm of contraception. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, a study came out a couple of years ago, I want to say, or maybe a year ago, that um, asked men w- how, how they felt like they had benefited from contraception. And f- 52% of men said that they didn't feel like they had benefited from contraception, wow. which when you take into account that 99% of women have used a contraceptive method at some point in their life. Um, there's a big disconnect there in how, yeah. you know, male and female people are kind of seeing this issue. And a lot of that really comes down to the idea of who is the person who benefits most. Right. Mm-hmm. And obviously pregnancy comes with a lot of health, um, and life changing aspects to it that if you are not the person that's carrying a pregnancy, um, you might not have that particular, you know, burden that you would bear if you, if you had, if you got somebody pregnant versus becoming pregnant yourself. However, obviously men benefit from contraception (laughs) in, in many ways. Um, and I do think that, you know, so so if you're thinking about ways that men can engage in contraception, it's kind of a, a controversial topic, right? So on one hand, you have people who are saying, you know, we need male, more male methods. And lots of people are doing lots of work right now to get some male methods mm-hmm. out on the table and, you know, say, okay, let's get men more options because right now they have vasectomy, withdrawal, and condoms, right? Yeah. Those are those are the those are the methods that are available to men. And and even though all of those are great methods, if you want to use them, they have some some drawbacks for each. And um people might not be as interested in one or more of them at different points in their lives because honestly, men are going through this same period of time where they can get people pregnant and what works for you at one point in your life might not work for you at another point. So the ability to have options and keep moving with things and, and adjust based on your circumstances makes a ton of sense. So there's that whole camp of, you know, let's develop more male methods. Is, does that also involve, I've, I've heard rumors of maybe a male birth control, like a pill. Yeah. So male methods, um, the, the, there's different kinds of male methods that are in development right now. Oh, okay. um, and if you, there's, there's different ways you can approach male methods. And one of them is, you know, to stop men from producing sperm and that's kind of where those hormones would come in so right now there's a couple of methods that are being developed where they are putting a progestin which is one of those hormones that um bodies produce um that's usually related to female bodied people Uh um but uh it would be a combination of progestin and testosterone um So progestin would reduce um, sperm count Mm -hmm. and then testosterone as kind of a balancing factor to make sure that men don't lose um, too much testosterone. (laughs) Um, So that's kind of in in development and they're testing out things like a shot or a gel um, that that would inhibit sperm production. But Mm -hmm. that's kind of one area. Um, So that's the outset. And then there's um, sperm transport in the male body, right? So that's where a vasectomy comes in. Um, If you wanted to get a vasectomy, you would 
cut the two pieces of the vas deferens. Mm -hmm. And um, what they're doing right now is they're experimenting with some gels that you could inject into the vas deferens. So it would be a non-surgical vasectomy. And then if you wanted to, you could put do another shot and dissolve that gel. So it could be like a, wow. a gel where it could occlude those those pipes, essentially. <laughs> um and then if you ever wanted to get pregnant, you would just get another shot and that would uh, reduce, you know, dissolve the gel and you could you could start producing again. So a less, inva- and less invasive vasectomy. Right, right. Uh-huh. So that's under development. And wow. then you have um, some methods that are under development right now looking at sperm motility. So once the sperm are released, mm-hmm. um, they've got their little tails and they're swimming and sperm the way that sperm swim is based on the types of hormonal signals that they receive. Um, so they're, they're constantly getting information and signals from their environment and that implicates how they move. Um, and so there's, there's some testing going on to try to figure out how do we, limit their their tail movements and it would um, make them spin in circles yeah or <laughs> yeah or, or just you know they swim a particular way when they're approaching the egg hmm. and if you can change the way that they swim and then they can't ever really get get over that hurdle to the egg wow. then you could potentially you know resolve that and one of the interesting things about sperm motility is that would be a method that you could develop and a man could potentially use it you know maybe he could put on a gel or something it could be in a condom that could inhibit sperm motility or maybe he could take a pill um and you could possibly put that in a woman's vagina Mm -hmm. and that could also inhibit sperm motility so maybe you could create something that would impact people on both sides um, that both people could use which would be really unique and cool that is fascinating yeah and then and then you know you have you know, what can we do to prevent, to create new barriers for, for inhibiting sperm? So there's lots of things with male methods. Um, but then it, when it comes to, there's a whole other camp of people who, who are thinking, you know, well, should, should men be the people who are really focusing on here? Because again, the, the majority of the burden of a pregnancy goes on female bodied people mm-hmm. and, um, there's a history of, you know, coercive practices around, you know, female body people who, you know, get pregnant against their will. And, you know, do we really want to focus on, on male bodied people when female bodied people are bearing the brunt of pregnancy and, yeah. and parenting a lot of the time? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, another thought in terms of male engagement is, you know, how can we engage men and make them supportive partners while at the same time maybe allowing that support to really direct toward the person who got who's going to get pregnant. Yeah. Um and and I think that there's a lot of ways that people can choose to be involved um that they currently don't necessarily do. Mm-hmm. Um and even things like paying for contraception. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Bearing some of that financial burden, um, contraception costs a lot. And for people who are getting particular methods, it could con- cost, you know, a thousand dollars, you wow. know, which is if you're getting an IUD or if you're getting it every month, that's, you know, 15 to 50 bucks that you're spending every month. Um, you could do a nice, a nice gesture and, and step up and start bearing some of those costs. Uh-huh. Um, Men can also be, you know, we've done some research on how men can be involved. And one of the things that men have said that they've tried to be involved with is, you know, being a support person for their partner to remind them to take their pills Mm -hmm. or to, you know, setting reminders and being being part of that system, um, being willing to pick up birth control or being willing to keep EC at your house. If you're a person who Mm -hmm. is male bodied, you know, just in the event, just like you would keep condoms, maybe consider keeping, keeping EC in the event that EC, what is, what is EC? Emergency contraception. Emergency contraceptive. So we got plan B. Yeah. Yeah. So you can buy those over the counter. Um, and I would advocate that if you're a person who has has sex and you use condoms, having something in case you have the condom breaks, um, is, is a great way to support your female partner. Yeah. Um, 
so that we're not scrambling at the last second of yeah, like, or so Walmart that and this is 60 she's bucks. right. So that she's not. And sometimes if you're going on a Sunday and things are closed, like having something at your house, if you're not in a relationship where it's, you know, a monogamous relationship is a great way to be a supportive partner mm-hmm. um, for that person who, who might then need to do something if you have sex that results in the possibility of pregnancy. Yeah. So if it's not a part of the plan of saying, okay, this might be something that I could, uh, we could foresee if, if this child, if we decide to have, if there is a pregnancy that's there, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. No matter what relationship I'm in, am I willing to, what, what am I willing to do if there is a pregnancy? And right. if there is something that I don't want to have, what are the means that I'm also going to take and the measures I'm taking to not have that pregnancy. Right, right. And and being really, really familiar with how you can best be supportive. You know, if it's behaviorally, if you are the person that reminds your partner or if it's financially and you're the person that helps pay for this or if it's, you know, even, even being supportive of the fact that contraception, particularly hormonal contraception, um, oftentimes results in people having side effects, you know, yeah. be the dude who's cool with the fact that <laughs> some, if somebody gets an IUD, they might have, you know, irregular bleeding for six months. Oh yeah. Get, get, get comfortable with period sex. Just mm-hmm. that's a way to be supportive of somebody when they're trying to do a different method. Mm-hmm. Um, learn how to use the methods that you can use in the the best way. So if you're a male and you're with a partner and you want to use withdrawal, learn how to use withdrawal. Yeah, get way. to know your body. Yeah, really, really figure out. You know what's what are the cues for you? You know what can what can you do and and make sure that you pee between sex. Yeah, <laughs> to yes. clear out that best difference. <laughs> um, just figuring out how to use those methods appropriately, and then if somebody, if your partner decides that she or they want to switch methods, Methods, mm-hmm. um, being willing to use condoms. So many men, uh, we hear a lot of people who are like, well, my partner really doesn't want to use condoms at any time. And you're like, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> use the condoms for the week that she's transitioning from one method to another. Yes. You know, that's, that's an easy way to, to be a supportive partner. It definitely. I like how you're bringing those up. It's just so fascinating where we've got being able to be in this relationship with somebody and the thought that we could have someone feel this uncomfortability with condoms, like, mm-hmm. oh, like my my pleasure doesn't feel as good in this way. And so I want to use the withdrawal method. And we were talking a little bit about the 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 feelings or the the experiences a, um, a male bodied person could do, such as the withdrawal method mm-hmm. or the pull out method. Yeah. Is there a site that someone could go to or any any place that someone could go to? to um, understand what the what the methods like you said urinating between um, between sex mm-hmm. in order to clear out the whole uh, the the def or the vas deferens and uh, do you say the vas deferens or the urethra the urethra the urethra yeah I said that wrong no I did <laughs> um, and being able to to know what they need to do in order to make it that much more effective. Cause from my understanding, the pull-out method is somewhere around like 70 something percent effective. I, that's like some things that I've read, but I'm wondering if, is there a place that we could go to find out these different methods and how successful they are supposed to be when you execute them? Right. Yeah. I, well, I will say with, with withdrawal, it's, it's a little complicated. So, Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's complicated by the fact that, um, I think, and this is just my personal opinion, um, there's evidence that shows, uh, studies that have been done on withdrawal, that if you do it right, it's it's almost as effective as condoms. So if you you use it correctly, um, 96 out of 100 people would be able to avoid pregnancy. So you'd have four people who became pregnant if you had a a year of use Uh um, in 100 people. Um, and with condoms, if you use those, if you use condoms, right, it's three people out of a hundred would become pregnant. So it's a difference of one pregnancy if you're using it correctly. And I think that's the main thing is correctly. Right. So the difference, um, so we have something in the, in the birth control world where we, uh, differentiate between 
perfect use and typical use. And uh-huh. typical use is, you know, real life happening. And when real life happens, um, what they found is that uh, over the years, condoms and withdrawal used to have the same typical use efficacy as well. So it was about a one pregnancy difference between a typical use with a condom and a typical use with um, withdrawal. Wow. And... Um, what they found is that that's actually changed uh, over the last few years where people have become really proficient in using condoms. Um, I think because we've done a lot of work teaching people how to use condoms the right way. Oh, yeah. And I think that withdrawal kind of suffers from that because there hasn't been as much education on how to use withdrawal the right way. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's not a lot of places that you can go to learn how to use withdrawal the right way. And it's not like there's campaigns out there that are like, want to use the pullout method? Here's how to do it right. You know, so... um, You can go on websites like Planned Parenthood and learn about how to use withdrawal correctly. Um, But some of the figures around the efficacy of withdrawal might be related to the fact that we haven't really educated people on how to do it right. Um, And less about the fact that, you know, it's it's so unsafe and scary. Yes. (laughs) Um, So I would, I would advocate that, you know, it's, withdrawal is not for everybody and it's definitely not for people who have unsupportive partners or partners who struggle with um, ejaculation dysfunction. So Mm -hmm. if you're a person who has a problem with, you know, early ejaculation or Mm pre-ejaculation or, or something like that, then you might not be a person that withdrawal is appropriate for. Mm -hmm. Um, When you say pre-ejaculation, is that with pre-ejaculate or is that premature ejaculation? So premature ejaculation. Premature ejaculation. Yeah. Most people have pre-ejaculate and there have been some studies that have looked at sperm content of Mm pre-ejaculate and they've found that, um, They found different things. I think there's been three or four studies that have come out and three of the four found no sperm in pre-ejaculate and one of them found a low count of sperm. So again, every method has a risk of pregnancy Mm -hmm. and I think if you were using withdrawal perfectly, those four pregnancies might be a result of pre-ejaculate sperm. mm -hmm. Um, So you would just need to know that that was a possibility. Um, But again, every method is, has its ups and downs and maybe for you in that circumstance, withdrawal might work for you. And if not, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can learn how to use withdrawal correctly if you went on Planned Parenthood um, websites or if you're looking at different things. But essentially, if you're a person who has a really good control of when you ejaculate and you can time that appropriately. And you know it. You've got to know and your you body. you know it and you can be comfortable with that. You know, there's also opportunities to practice that. So if you're a person who can masturbate, can you masturbate and then identify right about when you're going to come and behave differently? Could yeah. you move when you're doing that? A lot of times if, if men are really caught up in it, they're not thinking about that. But if you're a person who can right, try to practice that or think mm-hmm. about that, um, you can get better at making those decisions while you're experiencing this, uh, this feeling. So pulling out all the way <laughs> yes. before you ejaculate and then making sure that you ejaculate far away from the vagina, mm-hmm. um, and the vulva. Um, is, is really important. And then making sure that you urinate between sexual activity. Um, it's great so, to know. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> I think that comes to this, this next question, maybe not directly, but <laughs> to a point that we're talking about men and knowing their bodies. Yeah. And we've got this like fear about, you shouldn't know about your body. And right. Like, well, if we do, then, then you're, you're going to go have sex. And we're talking about adolescence or I'm talking about adolescence yeah. right now. Yeah. I would love to know how, when, like, should we start talking to our kids about, about contraception growing up for me? I remember thinking, Whoa, that girl's on the pill. You guys watch out because she, you know, is probably sexually active. I even had a girlfriend that was like, yeah, I'm thinking of going on the pill. And I was like, oh my gosh, then I know what you're thinking about. And I, <laughs> I can't do this. I'm just not ready. I'm 16. Yeah. And completely not understanding because I wasn't, that was like birth control. We call it birth control. Right. Is there a time when we should start talking to our kids about birth control and talking to our young men, young women? What should we do? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's there's a couple of things there. So the first thing is is that 
hormonal contraception. And when I'm talking about that, I'm like pills, patches, rings, shots, IUDs, all of these different methods. Um, they have other medical uses. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who are adolescent, um, a lot of times adolescents have menstrual irregularity, right? So when your body is just getting up and running, um, sometimes you can have really heavy, really painful periods, or you can have um, really spotty or irregular periods, or you can have mm -hmm. terrible cramps. Um, yeah. And that can be addressed in a natural way. Um, there's lots of things you can do if you're experiencing those as an adolescent. But a lot of times what people want to do is they want to have a medication that they can take mm -hmm. that will help with that. Yeah. Um, it also, there's a lot of kids who are suffering with acne and, yeah. and hormonal contraceptive methods also are really efficient at reducing acne. Um, which, which I believe Laura Bryden talks about the yeah. kind of the natural way of yeah. how you could start doing that. But I completely understand where, right. Hey, and, I don't want the acne. Give me, give me something. Right. And you might be a person for whom that's a decision that you want to make because you're not able to do all of the lifestyle changes that, you know, you might do. And maybe this, this thing works for you. Mm -hmm. I, I personally don't feel like you, I could make a choice for you one way or another, but yes. a lot of people make a decision to use hormonal contraception for non birth control benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the things with adolescence is, a lot of times adolescents nowadays are getting introduced to contraception through these other routes for other reasons, for acne, for period regulation, for that kind of thing. Um, but there are these, these fears and these worries from parents that uh, if, if you give it to them, it will make them more likely to have yes. sex. And we haven't seen any evidence that giving people contraception makes them more likely to have sex. Um, there's lots of evidence that it means that they're less likely to get pregnant, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it, there's less, there's less evidence that it, it stops people from actually engaging in, in sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think that if you're a parent and you're kind of navigating how to do this in some of my research, um, I've looked at the relationship that, method selection has to do with how your parents uh your parents attitudes around sex and oh. and we what i have found in in talking to different women about their experiences and navigating method choices is if you're a person who's um who is really concerned about you know your kids having sex and your kid is picking up on those messages um they're they're probably going to choose methods that they can hide from you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a, a, a woman that I spoke with who was recounting her, her youth and she said, Oh, well I was going to get started on the vaginal ring. And then I realized that I would have to put that in my refrigerator with, you know, with my parents and I didn't want my parents to see my rings in the <laughs> fridge. So I stopped doing that and, and didn't, didn't even fill that prescription once I realized that I had to refrigerate something. And then I started using pills because I could hide them in my purse or keep them at my friend's house. Um, or a person who said, Oh, I started getting the shot because then nobody mm. could ever tell that I had done something. Um, there were also parents who were very, uh, supportive of their kids getting on a method and and those kids chose different chose different things they just gotcha. were more open to getting things that were you know iud's or implants or things like that or mm -hmm. just whatever um so i think that the take-home message is that everybody's navigating um their value systems when they're making choices around what methods they're choosing um, or if they're choosing to use something or when or yeah. how. Um, but those choices are being made by the people who are doing the behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you can be a facilitator or you can be a blocker. Um, but there isn't a lot of evidence that your blocking is going to stop the activity oh so it's the same thing of if you if you feel like you can control everything 
it's really disappointing to find out you can't control everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that there are real conversations that we should be having with our kids about methods, um, and their periods and menstruation yeah. and m- maturation for, for male bodied people, yes. you know? Um, so when we, if we're comfortable having those conversations and, and letting our kids know that we can have those that can open doors. Even if you yourself don't necessarily facilitate, you know, here, I'm going to take you to your appointment to get pills. (laughs) Um, there's lots that you could still talk about with them about the different methods, about how to, to look at their own bodies and track their own cycles and really understand. Um, I have a, a friend who's, who's 14 year old is asking for an IUD and, it was a really great opportunity for her to have a good conversation with her kid about, you know, that's great, but are you prepared for the fact that IUDs usually make your period heavier and ir- more irregular? What would that look like for you? You're on the swim team. Mm-hmm. You know, how would you deal with that oh, for yeah. the first six months to a year? Are you prepared for that? Or are you prepared for the fact that it, it might hurt if you get it inserted? Are you ready for that? How, how could we navigate that? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of those types of things that you could you could talk to your kids about that would really help them be more set up to have a good experience um, in their health care because birth care is birth control is healthcare. <laughs> yeah, birth control is healthcare. Yeah. And I I as you touch on the maturation for male-bodied individuals. Yeah. I mean, if there's anything that kind of gets me on, on my own <laughs> like what I re- remember experiencing where my maturation program they couldn't say penis and they oh, couldn't yeah. say like it was just like you're going to get hair down there <laughs> and we're like okay, okay, like down where where's yeah, there? What the, do you there? mean? My, my knees? Yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> We th- there was no information, and it was to the point that the uh, the girls came back, and we had see through bags of deodorant and toothpaste and toothbrushes. Right. It was like, guess what, dude? You're gonna start to sweat. And we're like, heck yeah, sweating! I love this. <laughs> and the girls had had uh, paper bags, and we're like, what'd you guys get? Uh, and they were no, 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 yeah, yeah no, 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 no. We're yeah. we're not. And I'm like, come on, show me what toothpaste did you get? That's they had. They did not explain anything to us about menstruation, tampons, pads, let alone. I mean, we knew about birth control as the pill, right? And maybe a depo shot. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be crazy to not have a period for five years or whatever it was. <laughs> and so, not not knowing that, looking at it, if we teach our young man about, hey, this is what, just like what you said about the IUD, what you said about, you know, when when we're managing um, and trying to figure out birth control and even everything, the other reasons why someone would be on a birth control, yeah. um, then all of a sudden we can stop this assumption about why someone is on this. Right. And how they can participate if as they become partners. Not that they're going to start becoming partners at 14 no. or 18, but research has shown that they are. They might, yeah. Yeah, that, they might. That, you know, you can talk about them with your value system there, and that's important to have those conversations. But not having the conversation doesn't elicit uh, a non-sexual teenager, right? And I think that you know you have a real opportunity to set um, to set good values around condom use. So oh, one yeah. of the really interesting things that I have seen in my personal research. Um, around how people tend to navigate contraception is, you know, a lot of times people use condoms for their STD protection um, purposes. And the contraceptive benefit of a condom is kind of like a secondary benefit. Like you use condoms with people when you are having sex with them, but you don't know or trust them very much. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's this idea that they're just for STDs and they're just for, you know, to prevent against infections and to Mm -hmm. keep you safe. And a condom is great. But what that does when we have that environment of condoms as only this thing, um, it, it takes men away from being participants in contraception. Because when you have that relationship conversation with your partner and you have that determine the relationship and you're like, are we doing this? Are we long-term now? Do we trust each other? And the man and the women both say yes, or the partners both say yes. Then 
the female bodied person is like, okay, well then I'm going to go get on a real method. Mm -hmm. And she or they go to get on a, a hormonal method of contraception when in reality they were already using something. Um, and you can choose to use whatever methods that you want, but condoms are a real method. And when we give males the idea that condoms are just for std protection or they're just good for this or they're not as good as other methods the message that we're giving is you can't participate in this you're not you're not like this isn't as good mm -hmm. and that le can lead to problems later in life where a person might not be able to use a hormonal method, right? So there might be, oh, yeah. you know, contraindications. You might have health care or health reasons that you couldn't use a hormonal method of contraception, in which case maybe condoms are the best thing that you've got. And if you have a partner who's been conditioned to be like, ugh, I condoms. don't have to use this. I don't want to use this. This isn't my problem then you have people who, who don't have a lot of options available to them. So yeah. I think really emphasizing this idea that having those conversations about condoms and putting them in a positive light for, for male-bodied people is really important. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the things you're, you're touching on is pleasure with condoms. Yeah. I think that there is a lot of individuals, same with the, the pull-out method. Yeah. You've got... Um, I, I can't tell you how many friends or colleagues or friends or people that have talked to me were like, oh yeah, you know, I, I never wear a rain jacket because that is just, it doesn't feel good. Um, and it's a very interesting thing because it's these parents have been telling their kids, oh yeah, I, I never, you know, I used it once and I'll never use it again. And, yeah. and that's their experience. And right. we're not teaching that, try it. Try, how does this feel? How can you experience pleasure while using a condom? How can we work this so that it does work for you versus I'm going to use a condom or I'm not in the same way of if, I, if I'm going to use the pull-out method, then you're not a real man. Right. Or, you know, we right. need to challenge some of these as we're talking to our teenagers or we're talking to our adolescents because, yes, we want to teach. Um, if your value system is abstinence until marriage, right. wonderful. That is, that's a great, that is the 100% <laughs> method to not get pregnant. Right. But it, we've got to be real. Right. We have to be real with these kids. Well, and it's harder for, for male-bodied people to, to experiment with what is going to work for them if in a relationship where they're coming into this without a lot of knowledge. So, you know, I think if you're thinking about condom use, um, try different condoms, try lots of different condoms, yeah. different condoms from different makers from in different materials may have a completely different experience for you. Um, there's lots of new innovation going around in, in condom manufacturing. So you might be able to find something that feels amazing. Don't, don't start out with the like weird, <laughs> Cribbed for yeah, her place. Yeah, no, just I mean, but there's lots of different <laughs> brands that are really, really different and unique, and and putting out things that are really uh, that are you know condoms win awards. Look at who's winning awards in the condom. No kidding. Oh, there's yeah. a condom award there's ceremony. There's a condom award and I've ceremony. Missed it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that if you're a person who's planning on being abstinent, you know, and and you're planning on getting married and then having sex you should still know how to use condoms um, because there might be times when you want to use those. First of all, they make sex a lot cleaner. So maybe you just want to have cleaner sex one night. Mm -hmm. Understanding how to use a condom and why you might want to, it could always help you. Or if your partner goes through something and they don't want to use a hormonal method, a lot of times when people are just giving birth and they're coming off of mm -hmm. a pregnancy, um, you can use hormonal methods when you're coming off of a pregnancy, but you might not want to. Um, that would be a great time for you to be a supportive partner and use condoms. Yes. Um, it just, it adds to what you can use versus my pleasure is stunted a little bit or in this way or in that way or stunted a lot how can we make this work for, for both of us? Right. Because it is, if we say no to it, or if we say no to any and all of these, then we're, we're taking things off the table that, as you've mentioned at the very beginning, there's only three methods for, for male bodied people yeah. right now. Yeah. Come on. And then you rattled off like 25 <laughs> for <laughs> women. Yeah. There's a lot more for women right now than there are for, for men. Um, but at the same time, I do feel like, you know, if, if we have 
you could use all of the methods throughout your entire life. Again, we've got 35 years of oh, yeah. time. And for, for male-bodied people, even longer, because you can get people pregnant until until you croak, you know? <laughs> so, so it's, you know, you've got a long time of thinking about preventing pregnancy. So getting comfortable with all of the options and being open to using them all depending on the circumstances and thinking through what great circumstances could merit a particular method makes a ton of sense to me. Oh yeah. I, I completely agree with you. And as, as we're talking about this, it's, it's interesting to to think back on some of the other podcasts that uh, that I've done with with other guests, and it seems to continue to come back to let's have open dialogue right. and be curious. Yeah, let's be curious about have they thought of going on to a birth control? What have they thought of? What what are their experiences like with menstruation? Do they know about menstruation? Mm-hmm. Like, just if we can if we can leave you with that, that would be one of the things I would think of is just let's let's start this conversation, even though we're thinking okay, if we don't have sex, we don't have babies, we don't need to talk about contraception until until they're with a partner, until they're married. Right. And that's, I think that's a, another myth to be debunked here is that we need to start this conversation just as if we're talking about maturation. I agree. And I think that, you know, these methods are a part of maturation because knowing how and when to use them means that you're going to be a better partner mm-hmm. at some point. Totally. Now, this uh, the next question that I've got may only pertain to, it may be similar across the United States, and mm-hmm. it could be very different if you're listening in different countries, which we do, and we love having you on the, <laughs> we love having you listen to Birds and Bees podcast, um, especially those that may be listening in, uh, in well, I'd say New Zealand and Australia, and we've been having a big boom over there, oh, so great. I love it. Lovely. Um But as of right now, we've got Utah laws. Can you tell us a little bit about Utah laws? Yeah. So um, lots of great things have been happening in Utah recently, which is is fantastic, um, around contraception. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Not necessarily everything. (laughs) Just depends. Um, (laughs) I'm just going to be really specific. One of the good things that happened uh, this year is the Medicaid expansion. So Utah had... You know, under the Affordable Care Act, contraception is covered um, as a preventive service. So Mm -hmm. if you are a person who is covered under the Affordable Care Act, um, then you should be able to get your contraception without cost. And that includes all FDA approved methods. So condoms, vasectomy, female permanent methods. um, You should be able to get those under under the ACA. Um, But as you may or may not know, um, we have kind of a coverage gap because Utah mm-hmm. is one of very few states who didn't expand Medicaid. Um, yes, to cover so we the, got that gap in between. Yes, so we have this coverage gap, and a lot of people are falling into that coverage gap. And there's an estimated, I think it's two hundred and twelve thousand uh, women in Utah who would benefit from publicly funded family planning. Uh And so when we expanded Medicaid to 100% federal poverty, we did a little bit to close that coverage gap, which was great. Um, Last year, we passed a pharmacy dispensing bill that made it so that pharmacists could dispense um, the pill, the patch, and the ring without you needing to go to a doctor. So you should be able to go to your pharmacist. And certain pharmacies have taken this up and certain pharmacies are still rolling this out. Um, but for example, Harmon's I know, um, has this up and running. You should be able to go there and just say, Hey, I'd like to get a birth control pill and you wouldn't need to have a prior doctor's visit or a prescription. They can just give it to you. Gotcha. And can you work through the different pills there? Like we were talking, you could yeah, bounce should, through pills, say, yep. Hey, this one makes me feel this way. Yep. Can we try another? You should be able to get any pill from a pharmacist. Um, and then the ring and the, uh, patch. And the patch. Um, okay. The only downside to that is um, there, the you might need to pay the pharmacist a fee for that for gotcha. their for oh their for their time. consulting yeah, yeah. The, con- mm-hmm. the consultation yeah and that could be if you were doing it every month that might be a little bit expensive so you might want to think about it but it is an option if you don't have a doctor right now or if you don't have insurance mm-hmm. this is a way for you to get something that you might want um, and that could go across across the United States and maybe even internationally just depending on what uh, what your local laws are and I encourage everyone to, to look into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another good thing that happened last year was, um, a lot of, uh, female body people after they give birth, um, would like to have an immediate postpartum, 
uh, method, right? So mm-hmm. um, if you give birth, sometimes you can get a, an IUD or an implant put in right after you give birth, um, okay. within a few minutes of you giving birth. Okay. And that can be um, a really nice way of ensuring that you don't get pregnant while not forcing you to come back in six weeks for something when you're dealing with a new baby. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's really great. Um, but one of the problems has been that um, there's been some coverage challenges to that where it's if you're a person who's on Medicaid, um, Medicaid had the IUD kind of bundled up in a in a package, uh-huh. um, and what it meant was that it was hard for people to get these these methods that they wanted without doing a ton of paperwork up front to kind of make sure that their mm-hmm. coverage was the right time and all of these <laughs> things. And so um, last year they passed a law kind of debundling the immediate postpartum lark from from your birth your birth package under Medicaid so that this is kind of a separate thing. And it should make it easier for folks who want those methods to ask for them and say, Hey, I'd like an IUD placed or an implant put in at birth um, and have that be a streamlined process so that people aren't getting saying that they want something and then it's not happening. Gotcha. Um, So that's really good. Those, those three things are really big Mm -hmm. for Utahns. Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to, I I wanted to cover some of these laws because the laws change. Yeah. There's very much, contraception is very much a part of the the legislature and what we can and cannot do, what, what options we've got. Yeah. And so it changes from state to state, from country to country. And it's important for you to be one to, I encourage anyone to, to start marching, to start talking about what they want, whether it's for this, against that, whatever it may be, but being able to talk about what your what your values are and, and being able to understand where your rights are when it comes to contraception and what you have access to. If we don't know we have access to contraception and we're not using it, well, let's find out where your access to contraception is. And I think a lot of, you know, to that point, a lot of people would like different methods, different options. Um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that the more options that are available, the less un- unintended pregnancy there is. Wow. Um, so, so having all of the options available is a really important thing, whether you're in Utah, whether you're in Namibia, it doesn't matter. The more options people have, the more likely it is that they'll be able to, to avoid an unintended pregnancy at whatever point place they are in their reproductive journey, totally. you know, and, and so figuring that out and then also trying to, to advocate for more methods being available, even saying, you know, to your own provider, if your provider doesn't offer something, Hey, I, I want that thing. Uh-huh. Um, because a lot of times providers have this idea that there's no demand for a particular method. And so if you say, no, I, I, I I'm that person, please. I, I want it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, the vasectomy is one of those where a lot of providers don't offer that. They don't know how to do it. They're not trained. And the reason is because they don't perceive that a lot of people want that. Mm. Um, and, you know, same with like fertility awareness based methods. A lot of providers don't offer them because they don't think that people are interested in them. Um, so if you wow. want them, raise your hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> Tell them. It. Yeah. Speak up. We yeah. have to talk about it. Just right. like we're talking with our kids, we've got to talk with it with your provider. Right. And they they will listen and respond. Like wow. if, if people say, I want a vasectomy, somebody's going to try to figure out a way to get that for you. Wow. So. Well, that is, I'm so excited to hear the rest of what you're going to be talking about when it comes to the Rocky Mountain Sex Summit. Yeah. Uh, that's actually going to be this week. So as this podcast is airing, um, hop on RockyMountainSexSummit.com, uh, get your ticket. We'd love to see you there. I'll be there. And Rebecca's going to be there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for being on on the episode today. I'm really excited to get this out to everybody. And gosh, what, you, what you've been sharing with us, I think is so important. Thank oh, you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Really a pleasure. Thank you again for listening to Birds and Bees Podcast. We'll catch you on the next episode. And as always, keep the buzz alive. This has been another episode of the Birds and Bees podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions about the show, comments, or questions you would like addressed in another episode, please give us a call at 385-449-1818. Leave your voicemail 
and your question. Or you can also email us at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com or visit us online at birdsandbeespodcast.com. 